This video is about the basics of prenatal development. Prenatal development, of course, starts with fertilization, which is the fusing of an egg and a sperm. There are some extraordinary images of this available on the internet. On the left, we have one of these images, which is an egg covered in tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of sperm who have made it through the vaginal canal, chosen the appropriate direction to turn up either the left fallopian tube or the right fallopian tube, because remember, they don't know exactly where there might be an egg, and then have found an egg in the fallopian tube. Oftentimes, we think about this process as sperm-driven. The sperm is there to conquer the egg. It triumphantly has made it and found the egg, and then the first one to push through is the one who wins and gets to fertilize it. And that's actually not really an accurate representation. What truly happens is there are proteins on the head of each sperm, and when they reach the egg, they start to rub that head with those proteins on the side of the egg, looking for the appropriate protein receptors that are covering the egg. And if there's a matchup between the egg's protein receptors and the sperm's protein, then the egg actually opens and allows that sperm in and then closes off to all other sperm by changing the chemical makeup of the outside. So that's how we end up with just a single egg fertilized by a single sperm. So this fertilization process generally happens in a fallopian tube. If there's an egg, it's been ovulated a small number of days beforehand and is moving down a woman's fallopian tube. If it meets with a sperm, then the sperm have the opportunity to fertilize it. If fertilization does occur, we now call the fused sperm and egg cell a zygote. And a zygote really is just a single-celled fertilized egg. There are three stages to the development process after fertilization. The first is called the germinal period. So after we have the fertilized egg or the zygote, it basically starts dividing so that one cell turns into two, two into four, four into eight, etc., etc. So we just have massive amounts of cell division and this happens for the first probably eight to ten days after fertilization. The germinal period is where we find something called totipotent stem cells. Each of these cells that you see here are essentially totipotent stem cells, which is a designator that say it's a kind of stem cell that could turn into absolutely anything. And that's true at this point because we have a bunch of cells that have the ability to become any kind of cell in a human body. Some will eventually become hair cells, some will become skin cells, some will become heart cells, some will become toenail cells, brain cells, liver cells, etc. But at this point, they don't have their jobs yet, they're just cells. Eventually though, cell differentiation does happen, and that's just the term we use to talk about cells getting their specific job. So they differentiate and start doing something specific. Once they do that, they can start to form the systems that will make up the human being. So we move now into the embryonic period once this differentiation has happened and systems start to form. So on the left, we see an embryo very early in this period, and on the right, we see an embryo that's a lot later towards the end of this period. And you can see that in the beginning, we don't really look very human. We look a little bit alien and have some characteristics, like a tail, for example, that seems strange to us. If you were to look on the internet for images of the embryos of other species, you would find that those embryos look a lot like our own human embryos. But slowly, through self-differentiation uh, and the building up of systems, we start to build arm buds, which we can kind of see in the middle portion of the middle image, a portion that will eventually become an eye. The circulatory system starts to come into place. At some point, the heart will start beating. And that tail starts to get absorbed. You can see the tail in the middle picture is much smaller than it is in the left, and that's because it's being absorbed. And then in the right, there isn't a tail anymore. The hand and arm buds have grown to be more like actual hands and arms. We're looking a little bit more human-like by the end of the embryonic period. Then in the fetal period, the third and final period, which is pretty much from two months up to birth, we're very human-like, just growing bigger. So on the left, we see a fetus who is probably towards the two to three month mark and is about the size of a person's thumb. And on the right, we see a fetus that's getting towards the end of the term, which is 40 weeks of development, and he's pretty big and packed in the womb. Of course, some babies don't make it to the 40-week term date. They're born early, and we call these premature babies, or preterm infants. So preemies are something that our culture is dealing with because we have the ability to keep infants alive outside of the womb much better because of medical technology than we were able to do before. And because of that, we have to start worrying now about the survival rate because, of course, if an infant is born too early, they really aren't fully prepared to deal with the outside world. They would like to stay a fetus longer and be able to completely develop. 
So not just in terms of size, because you can see both of these pictures are very small babies, but also in terms of, of developing things just like fat. So the infant on the top, the premature infant on the top, has very, very little body fat, and that's why it looks so skinny and long and kind of disproportionate to what a full-term baby would look like. So the survival rates are approximately the following right now. At about 22 weeks of development, which again, remember, is barely over half because a full term would be 40 weeks, uh, the survival rate is fewer than 10%. So very few babies who are born this early live because they're just not prepared. One of the major problems is lungs. Lungs are one of the last things that develop, so it's difficult to breathe if your lungs aren't working very well. However, if you can keep that baby in there just one more week, um, the survival rate jumps quite significantly up to 53%. So sometimes women who go into preterm labor are put onto bed rest in an effort to keep the labor from actually progressing to the point where a delivery would be required. Because if you can keep that fetus in there for just even one more week, the survival rate is quite substantially higher. At 24 weeks, it's 67%. At 25 weeks, it's 82%. And at 26 weeks, it's 85%. So still, 26 weeks is quite early, but the survival rate has jumped dramatically just in the four weeks from the 22-week development. And that has to do with things like development in the lungs. Of course, things aren't just going on with the developing fetus. There are things are happening with the mom's body as well. One thing that oftentimes women are concerned about is weight change or weight gain. So this is approximate breakdown of what a woman is going to gain because of the various parts of her body and the fetus's body that are going to change during pregnancy. So first, she's going to gain about four pounds of extra blood volume. Quite a bit of that will come from her own blood volume because she needs to be able to carry more nutrition and oxygen. Some of it will come in the form of blood in the baby system and in the placenta two pounds of extra uterus, the uterine walls thicken to be able to maintain the pregnancy, 1.4 pounds of placenta, so the placenta again is the thing that connects the mom to the fetus and is the transmitter of nutrition in and waste out, 1.8 pounds of amniotic fluid, that is the fluid that the fetus is floating in within the womb, within the amnion, one pound of breast tissue in preparation for breastfeeding, 2.7 pounds of interstitial fluid. This is fluid that is basically just the water within our cells. Everybody already, no matter what, has interstitial fluid. And when a woman is pregnant, she gets more interstitial fluid, which is why a lot of pregnant women experience swelling of the feet or the ankles or the lower legs, especially towards the end of pregnancy, because they have so much more water essentially in their system that as they walk around throughout the day, gravity pulls that water down and it collects in the feet and ankle area. 5 to 10 pounds of just body fat are very normal for a woman to gain. And then, of course, 7 to 7.5 pounds of baby, totaling 25 to 30 pounds. So a typically sized woman should gain somewhere between 25 and 30 pounds during pregnancy. This is going to depend, of course, on things like your height and your build. But regardless of your starting point, there is a certain amount of weight that's healthy to gain. Not gaining enough weight is problematic, and gaining too much weight is also problematic. The other contributing factor that the mom provides is the environment both outside of herself and what she consumes and puts into the womb. So teratogens have to do with the latter. Teratogens or teratogens are harmful chemicals that could impact negatively the development of the fetus. These are things like alcohol or tobacco or hard drugs or even things like caffeine. There's some research that points to the increased likelihood of a miscarriage if a woman consumes a lot of caffeine. But other factors are important too. First, does the mom have any particular diseases that could harm her developing baby? So for example, if the mom was HIV positive, that would be of concern because there's a likelihood of being able to pass that on to the fetus. And in some parts of the world where a lot of women are HIV positive, this is a major concern. There's also concerns about things like keeping women from handling kitty litter because kitty feces can contain a parasite called toxoplasmosis that could cause some problems. Women, of course, should exercise while they're pregnant, just in general in life, you should exercise. But during pregnancy, it's important to maintain a healthy body weight. It's also important to help build up your strength and stamina because birthing, of course, is a very challenging process. And women who have stronger core systems or who have better stamina are going to not struggle quite as much. Nutrition is key, eating healthy, whole foods, lots of fruits and vegetables, avoiding a lot of sugar or fat. Remember that developing fetus is laying down the very basic systems that they will live with for the rest of their life. So 
being able to have enough of the appropriate nutrients to build those systems are important. So you maybe have heard, exact, for example, about folic acid being really important for brain development prenatally, and that's true. So women should eat a lot of foods that have folic acid in them, amongst other kinds of foods, of course. Stress has been shown to be able to impact the developing fetus. For example, high, high levels of stress. There's less research that point to the problems associated with just general, regular day-to-day -day stress. But women who are experiencing extreme stress, like the loss of a loved one, or maybe a loss of a job, can sometimes pass that stress on to their developing infant because our body releases hormones and chemicals when we're stressed, cortisol and adrenaline, it's part of that fight or flight response, and it's possible for those to pass through the placenta and impact the system of the fetus. Maternal age is important. This is especially something to consider as women are having babies later and later in life because of the availability of things like fertility treatments. So there's some concerns with propensity for particular disorders or diseases. For example, Down syndrome is more likely, much more likely, in women who are older than younger. And finally, prenatal development can be influenced by whether the woman has had previous births or not.